Welcome to the Champs App Podcast, where we help players and parents demystify the world of minor hockey development and recruiting for both girls and boys. On today's episode, we chat with Ryan Vesey, co-founder of Matterhorn Fit and the Ivy League Men's Hockey Showcase. Ryan shares how he was able to leverage his college experience into a 14-year professional career, which included a couple of seasons in the NHL. We also discuss the unique elements of the Ivy League Showcase that allows players and parents to get the most from attending the event. Ryan provides some great hockey advice, like how to score goals, and developing a path to a college hockey career. This was a great conversation with Ryan, so I hope you enjoy it. Champs App is your recruiting and development co-pilot. Champs App helps athletes, coaches, parents, and agents slash advisors navigate the world of youth sports. We recently completely redesigned Champs App so that all our offerings fit together seamlessly to dramatically improve the user experience. Next time you visit Champs App, you will see that it is much easier to use Champs App as your co-pilot for recruiting and development. While we will continue to provide free content and tools like podcasts, articles, and directories on our website, some new content will require a free Champs App account to access special analysis and information. We have made it easy to create a free Champs App account without the need to create an online profile. Our latest free tool is the Champs App Team Coach Directory a powerful resource designed to simplify your search for D1, D3, and youth sports coaches in one convenient place. Whether you're a parent, player, or youth coach, our directory offers a seamless way to find, research, connect, or message coaches across women's college hockey. In addition, our first premium product has been the Champs App Messaging Tool, which is the fast, easy way to send error-free messages to coaches. Champs App Messaging cuts the time to send emails to coaches by over 50%. Over the coming months, we will continue to offer additional premium tools and services to our community. We still have a long way to go to achieve all the big goals we have for Champs App. You will see new offerings being released over the coming months. So look out for more announcements on social media, in your email, and in the app. We look forward to helping you on your journey as your sports recruiting and development co-pilot. I'm very excited to have on the podcast Ryan Vesey, who is the co-founder of Matterhorn Fit and the All Ivy Showcase. Originally from Lloyd Harbor, New York, Ryan won a youth national championship with the Long Island Gulls prior to attending Cornell University, where he was the team's leading scorer in his junior year and captain in his senior year. After graduation, Ryan played 14 seasons of professional hockey, which included playing in the NHL for the San Jose Sharks and an international career that took him to Finland, Sweden, Switzerland, Russia, Belarus and Croatia. In 2018, he started Matterhorn Fit, a world-class rehabilitation and training center. And for the past four years, he has also run the All IV Showcase to provide academically focused men's D1 prospects an opportunity to be seen by top NCAA schools. Welcome to the podcast, Ryan. Thanks for having me. Why don't we start off like we do all of our uh, guests and just maybe share a little bit of how you became such a great hockey player, good enough to eventually make it to the NHL. Yeah, uh, thank you first for having me on and... You know, I, I don't consider myself a great hockey player. I definitely was a player who uh, earned, you know, every game I got at every level. So I grew up I grew up in Long Island, uh, played for the Long Island Gulls uh, all the way through uh, Bantam. We were fortunate enough to win a national championship in 1996. Uh, head coach of that team was like famous John Tonelli and Rich Hansen. Both were, you know, New York Islanders. Um, we had a great group of kind of guys and players and, they ran it like a, an NHL organization for, for young, for young kids. But um, do you think that continue. having former NHL players as your coach really helped you develop better? Yeah. I mean, at the time that was for, for me, you know, Tonelli and Hanson, they were, you know, by far the two best coaches I ever had. And they taught me so much about puck movement. And that was a big thing. I think that made me uh, be able to be successful and be able to kind of, uh, would stand a long career because I knew how to play, I knew how to play without the puck, knew how to move it quickly and use guys around me, which actually coincidentally is kind of a lost art. I feel like nowadays there's a lot of skill development and a lot of uh, Instagram, you know, tricks with the puck, but you know, the simple, the simple consistent play at the right time is often uh, overlooked in this game, in this day and age of youth hockey. So, um, but I ended up, you know, learning a ton from them and, Played junior hockey for the New York Apple Corps, which was a, a great junior organization back in, back in the day there, and uh, went as a true freshman to Cornell and played my four years there. So let me ask you something. It's my understanding that you had like 10 players from, from your Long Island 
uh, national championship team went to play D1 hockey. Where did you yeah. rank within those 10 that, that, that went on to play college hockey? So I started, yeah, I started on the fourth line of that team. Um, worked my way up to, you know, somewhere between the third and, and second line by the end of the season. Uh, I was one of two kids born in 1982 on the team. So the whole team was 1981 birth years and 1980, you know, some late birthday, 1980 birth years. So we're, we're a little younger, but, and I was certainly undersized as I've always been. And so, uh, you know, in, in Bantam hockey, which is the year where, you know, puberty hits and there's a lot of differentiation between different players and sizes, you know, I was definitely on the smaller scale and had to really work my way up and get, earn the trust from the coach and continue to kind of prove myself, which was a great uh, learning lesson for me, not being the best player, really being in a situation where I had to earn my ice time. And it really kind of put, you know, a lot of perspective into the game later on, you know, about how to kind of earn your spot. And so w would you consider yourself like naturally talented or someone who just really works hard and took the coaching to, and applied it? <laughs> yeah, I think I was someone who physically wasn't gift, you know, overly gifted. Um, you know, obviously like I wasn't a kid who was like, lightning fast or yeah obviously super strong but I had I was very talented in my hockey sense I knew how to play I knew I could see the ice I knew how to move the puck but taking that and then really you know working on my game and, and craft and I just you know I'm somewhat known for just continuing to develop myself you know and that that went all the way through I was you know, the, the late years when I'm 36, I just continue to get better each and every day. And this is something we preach to, you know, all of our athletes in our facilities and, you know, people that we talk to at our events. It's, it's really about uh, maximizing your potential and getting better, you know, every single day. So where did that come from? You know, I know uh, Michael Jordan is kind of one of your idols. Like, how, how did you like get that um, impetus in your brain to say, I, you know, I always get better, right? Um, Marquez yeah. St. Louis' famous line is, you know, I was never the best player, but I was better at getting better than anybody else. Yeah, I think, you know, I think it's uh, first and foremost, it's a love for the game. So you have to love, if when you love the game, you love to work and you love your craft and you love trying to get better, you know, each and every day. And that's not a chore to go and work on something. Or So I think that's first you know, secondly, I think my parents, you know, ingrained a, a very strong work ethic uh, from a very young age. And uh, my dad was a self-made, you know, guy. He, he, you know, grew up in Brooklyn and, you know, started his own business and, as an entrepreneur and, you know, was very successful, you know, as an entrepreneur and really didn't come from much, but worked hard and, you know, was very uh, um, disciplined and focused. But yeah, I think I think really comes down to loving the game and loving to work and then really having an understanding that, you know, you're never at your potential. There is no uh, peak. You always can get better and it never stops. And that's always my mentality, you know, for the longest, as long as I can remember, is just always trying to get better. And even, like I said, at 36, I was in Switzerland in the in the B League and, you know, still doing things to make myself better and improve my game. So. Perfect. All right. So um, you weren't drafted and um, I don't know if you, what age you were when, when you started at Cornell, but you know, how did you feel at that point when you're, you're going into Cornell, you haven't been drafted, you know, maybe some of your former teammates have been drafted, you know, what's your mindset going like, Hey, you know, how did you end up at Cornell and what, what's your mindset about wh where your future lied in hockey? Yeah, I was always like confident in my abilities and I, I always felt like I was a good player, but always also recognized that I was overlooked a lot. And a lot of that was the size issue back then. We were in an era where, you know, if you were big, you, you know, if you look at the national program for my birth year, I mean, they were just an enormous, enormous team, you know? So, um, yeah, I went into Cornell at 18 and just, you know, same mentality, just trying to earn my ice time or forget, you know, first forget trying to be the first liner, just try to, you know, get in the lineup was really the first step. And then work your way up. And I think the coaches there were really a good fit for my personality. It was a, a blue collar team, definitely a blue collar Ivy League school at Cornell. Mike Schaefer does an unbelievable job. There's an incredible culture and work ethic there. And so I fit into that, you know, really well. And I think that's, you know, one of the reasons why I got some opportunity early on. Gotcha. And uh, you, you were, at least at Cornell, you scored lots of goals. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in your second year, or sorry, your third year, you, you, you led the team in points. So I'm just curious, um, you know, how do you score goals? What's the secret to scoring so many goals? You know, I think, I think as a smaller guy is get you know, and, and a bigger guy, but it's really getting to the net, 
you know, I, I can't remember scoring many goals from outside of, you know, the bottom of the circles down, you know, that was kind of where I made my living and would go into those tough areas and, you know, being smart about timing and getting in, in and out of spaces, but never afraid to kind of go to those dirty areas and, and pick up some points there. So um, that's kind of how I scored that year before my junior year. I really improved my skating. I went out to British Columbia and went to a skating camp. Uh, you know, I felt like it was something that I really needed to get better at. Um, and so just having a little extra step enabled me some more opportunities and, you know, worked on my shot, you know, relentlessly uh, over the course of my college career. And, you know, that translates simple things, but they translate into, you know, more chances and, and more goals. So I got you. So I, cause what I thought may have been one of the reasons why you did so well in your third year is because in your second year, um, Doug Murray actually outscored you in points. And, and I saw a lot <laughs> of Doug Murray in, in San Jose, who is you know, a beast of a defenseman, but boy, that guy could not skate very well. And if he's uh, beating you in points as a D that must've probably sent you out to the BC to get, take some skating lessons. I'll defend, I'll defend Dougie. I'll defend Dougie here. He, uh, he had a lot more skill than, you know, than he was given credit for. And he definitely, as he got to the pros, his skill level went down. I felt like, because he was, you know, his game was simplified, but when you saw him in college, I mean, he was making plays. He had an absolute bomb from the point he, he was on, you know, played in the power play. We had number one power play in the year for, obviously that helps getting points and scoring goals too. But, um, yeah, he, he, he was a special human being, a special player, great guy. Yeah, and he's still yeah. local here to the Bay Area. And, and his nickname when he was on the Sharks was Crankshaft, I believe. And, That's right. That's uh, right. And his other claim to fame, which it sounds like, you know, you, maybe you guys took the same entrepreneurial class, but he also helped invent the Uber tap, which was, right. uh, you know, you're familiar with <laughs> what I'm talking about? Yeah, so it's like this fancy machine to help uh, tap kegs at the uh, at the local frat parties. Um, yes. And, and you also, you know, took the entrepreneur route, starting Salmon Cove, a clothing company. Is that a coincidence that both you two, or was that part of the curriculum that the hockey players had to start a company? No, it's so funny. I mean, Doug and I were very similar with, like, um business and thinking, you know, outside the box. And just, we, ha all, we always had a, um, we we're able to separate ourselves from the game. And I think a lot of people maybe don't do that. They, they're just hockey players and that's what they are. And just by our upbringings and both our families, we we're able to kind of have some, uh, you know, encouragement to start something and, you know, learn a business and, and do something like that. So my, my college roommate, Ben Wallace, uh, and I, we started at Salmon Cove and, uh, it was a great, great experience for both of us. Perfect. Yeah. And uh, you en ended up having to sell it because you went and played overseas, but uh, you know, you, yeah. you were able to actually, uh, you know, make something out of the company and, uh, and get some yeah. liquidity out of it. So congratulations on that. Yeah, All right. You. So, um, so, so, uh, obviously, you had a great career at Cornell. Um, you you graduated at a horrible time when the <laughs> NHL shut down, and you had to go play in, in Europe for a year because there there were no uh, professional yeah. jobs in in the NHL that season, and and they pushed everybody down who was coming up from uh, the college ranks. Maybe just talk about like you know you know how you thought about where your career would go at that point. You know, like you said, let me let me read you know the the. Um, elite prospects review of you, um, which is Vesey is a skilled center. He has great hockey sense and fantastic puck control, even in heavy traffic. Also owns a terrific shot and leadership qualities. Is somewhat lacking in size, strength, and skating skating ability, though. I mean, that was that's like the the worst sandwich I've ever heard. So <laughs> you got a phenomenal hockey player who yeah. doesn't have any of the yeah. basics. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. That was pretty much accurate. <laughs> <laughs> so, what was your thought? But like, okay, you know, you you eventually you know had more than just a cup of coffee in the NHL. You scored some goals uh, in some big games. Um, but like, what was your thinking of you graduated Cornell and like, like, was your goal to make it to the NHL? Did you have the confidence to do that? And, and, and how did you persist through, through the multiple years of having to struggle to get there? Yeah. I mean, um, yeah, my goal was always to make the NHL and <clears throat> that's a goal you have when you're a little kid, like growing up and it never really changed for me. So, you know, I first year was in Sweden. Uh, I couldn't get in the American league. As you said, I went over overseas, played in Sweden, in the second league, the Allsvenskan. Um, the bigger ice surface definitely helped me. It was one of these uh, really nice fits for my development, uh, skating wise and having some freedom to really play. Uh, we played um, definitely a very disciplined system at Cornell. And this was the first time I was able to kind of, you know, pass my college career wreck and able to like really uh, be creative and had the freedom to kind of, you know, play as, as creatively as I want. The coach gave me a ton of freedom. So 
uh, it was great for development in that respect. And it really kind of, you know, kicked off some more confidence at the pro level, I think, and just the fact that there were NHL guys in the league. And after seeing them and seeing where my level was at, I felt like, you know, I wasn't that far off. So. Gotcha. And so how, how did you able to, you came back to, to the States, you played in the centers organization. How did you end up back at the sharks? You know, was, you know, did, did Doug Murray help you out you know, with a reference in any way? How did that all work out? No, you know, I, Tim Burke was uh, the head of player development at the time. Uh, I think that was his title, but he was uh, very involved in the selection of players. And he brought me out during college to a development camp with San Jose. He kind of was a believer. Um, you know, I, I owe a ton to him. He, I was kind of one of his guys who he felt like, you know, could surprise people and had a chance. And he brought me in and I think they brought me into Worcester to really be a leader in the minors and have some depth and maybe they can call, you know, call a, a seasoned guy up if, if we need. And um, yeah, that's what kind of happened. There was a bunch of injuries and, you know, I was having a really good year in the minors and, you know, got an opportunity to play for Todd McClellan, who is a phenomenal coach and just with a great group of, of guys in San Jose who, you know, some Hall of Famers on there and some, you know, very high profile players who um, were just also great teammates. So. Perfect. And, and do you feel like you, you, you achieved what you, everything you possibly could have in terms of, you know, the, your potential uh, as, as it relates to the NHL? Cause obviously you had a very successful career after playing over in Europe, but did you feel like yeah. you kind of maximized what you had given, uh, given the package that you got? Yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, I, I, that second year I got called up, I got given a, uh, you know, pretty good opportunity to play, you know, on the top line. I was playing with Joe Thornton and Danny Heatley. And, you know, that's, that was because of injuries, right? Guys are going to come back. I think Pavelski was out, Setaguchi was out. So like when those guys come back, you know, they're going to, you know, that's, that's their roles. But um, for me, that was a great opportunity. I did very well in the games I, I played up. I ended up having a knee injury in the fourth game and that kind of cut that, that stint a little bit, a, a little bit short. I was out for a month. And then when I came back, I was, quickly sent down uh, to the minors, but you never know. I feel like at the end of the day, like I was very satisfied with how my career went and how uh, everything turned out because I knew I gave a hundred percent to again, development and getting better. And, you know, I think I maximized my potential. So <laughs> Perfect. All right. So um, following that, obviously, you went and played in Europe. We talked about all the different countries that you played in. You never played, you know, in the same country for more than a couple of years or at least the same team. Um, what was that like? Just like, uh, you know, I, I believe you were either engaged or you're definitely with your girlfriend yeah. who who was um, who happened to have also been the captain of the women's lacrosse team. Um, yeah. You know, and she, she's, I believe, working in New York while you're over in Europe. Like, what's this like yeah. as you're trying to pursue a professional career and and, you know, you're separated and you're, you're, you're trying to give it all you can every year yeah yeah so she came with me um every every year to europe except for the first year when she was working in new york and then my two years in the american league she was still working when we went to finland we got engaged and that's where uh she kind of came with with me full time wherever whatever country i was in she always had you know a job and was always working in these countries she was a, a international school teacher teacher in helsinki she was working in a staff for a staffing company virtually we're in Russia and, you know, she always had a job and she was always very, um, you know, productive with her time. So, uh, but she always supported me and the adventure of going from city to city is, was, was awesome. And we miss it quite a bit when you get in that lifestyle of exploring a new city and checking out new restaurants and the culture and everything. It's, it becomes a little bit addicting and we weren't, it's not for everyone. Some, some players go over there and they can't handle your Europe. It's not, it's too out of the norm for them for, Kate and I, we loved, we loved it. And uh, our kids were over there. My daughter was born in Helsinki. Um, my oldest daughter and some were born in Florida, but they came, you know, came with us. And so it was a great family experience for sure. Perfect. All right. So now you, you were uh, challenged by some injuries during your career, and that relates to how you ended up starting uh, Matterhorn Fit. Maybe just talk about the challenge of, you know, men's hockey. Uh, the reality is that there's a lot of injuries and a lot of people play through injuries. Maybe just talk about like the challenge of playing through injuries and then, you know, some of the learnings that you've had from that as it relates to eventually starting Matterhorn Fit. Yes. I mean, I, I had eight surgeries in my career and, uh, you know, a couple major ones I had after my first year in, it was a little bit into my second year in Russia, I had back surgery uh, about 15 games in. 
and then rehabbed the whole year, came back for the playoffs, playoffs ended, needed a hip surgery. They thought it was related to the back um, and ended up getting a hip surgery. So I pretty much was out for like almost a full year, six month recovery, played eight games, another six you know month recovery. So um, it was at that point where I played for another year and a half pretty poorly. And um, I had access during the course of my career and travels in Europe to all these elite practitioners. And they always looked at pain, injury, and mo movement dysfunction from a neurological level. And so out of desperation, I started combining those techniques with my strength coach, Sean Sullivan, who's my partner in Matter Aren't Fit. And we put into one integrator process uh, to identify the root cause of the problem from a neurological level and to retrain those patterns and then strengthen with his strengthening protocols to prevent that problem from coming back. And it was one of these miraculous things in my life. I ended up playing another five years pain-free. And in 2018, when I retired, we said, let's see if this could work for other people, not only other athletes, but everyday individuals, active seniors, and kind of across the whole, you know, age population, age and demographic population of, of our area. So we started Matter Aren't Fit. And fast forward almost six years later, now we have uh, our corporate, two corporate locations, one in Bonita Springs, Florida, one in Naples, Florida. Uh, we built a very good track record uh, with our results on the rehabilitation side as well as the performance side. And uh, so we decided about 18 months ago that we were going to start uh, building out all the systems to, to franchise. And so we've done that. We just closed our first franchise. They'll open in October. Um, they're going to be in Fort Myers. We're going through the process with a number of other ones. Um, and it's really exciting time because we have a very unique process that's uh, proving to outperform other types of therapy and create a culture of hope of hope and which is really um what our brand is all about it's about inspiring hope and uh delivering you know the the very best the, a professional athlete level of care to the everyday person so perfect yeah so one of the insights that i had about you know the the process that you've developed is that you know when I think of all the hockey players that play hurt and then they end up having secondary injuries or compensation injuries as a result yeah. of it. And that, that, that just sounds like a really common thing with a lot of athletes, especially, you know, hockey players or, you know, rugby players yeah. who, who just play through pain. And then they ended up, you know, causing more damage than good elsewhere than they expected. Um, maybe just talk about like how, how that kind of stuff that players shouldn't be doing that in the first place, but if they do like, you know, why, yeah. why, how the two are correlated and, and, and how, how to solve that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, when, <clears throat> when you have um, an area of the body that's not communicating with the brain, when you go to move, that force ends up going to the wrong places. And when too much force ends up in the wrong places and not the right ones, then you become a threat for a tear, a strain, or too much force goes there, your brain wants to protect and restricts range of motion, shuts down uh, your movement and doesn't allow you your uh, max power output. And so you become in this guarded, protective state. And so what we do is we figure out exactly where that's coming from. And then we retrain that to unwind that uh, poor pattern and take out that compensation. And then we build a personalized movement plan to prevent that from coming back. And from an athlete or a general, you know, population, you know, individual, um, the process is very similar and it's really um, equally as beneficial, I think for a 60 to 80 year old as it is for a professional athlete, but you know, it's something that, um, what we do is really unique and we were able to, uh, help athletes maximize their potential. I think from the, from the athletic standpoint. Perfect. All right. We, we can have a whole separate episode just going into this stuff, but I think our audience wants more to talk about hockey. Um, so yeah, yeah. Let, let, let's get into that one. So maybe just talk about why you started the, uh, Matterhorn Ivy showcase. Um, and for folks who, uh, you know, um, let me just give a little bit of background that I actually took my son to this back in, um, I guess it was April. Um, and, and, and as I told you just before we started, it was basically the best showcase that I've been to with in any of my kids. Um, we'll go into some of the details, but maybe just talk about the, uh, the background as to, to, to why you, you, why you started it and, and how you differentiated it. Yeah. And really we were dealing with a lot of hockey players in the area and we felt like there was a common theme of everyone trying to play division one, but there was no real focus on trying to go to a really good school. And so we felt like that was a, a big problem, right? I, in my mind and for my kids, it's really using the sports to get to the, the best school possible. That's, that's the goal for my family. And I felt like that message could be really um, ingrained and we could actually influence parents and players to feel the same way about using hockey as a vehicle to get into the best school they can. 
And so that's really why we started the event. Um, what we didn't know at the time was we started the event and we, we had this, we didn't know how it would take in the market, right? So we were going to do six teams the first year. So we got each of the Ivy League coaches. They loved the, the mission. And we said, okay, let's start this with six teams. We filled six, like no problem very quickly. We're like, oh, let's go to eight. We ended up settling on 12 teams. Um, and that was the first year, 216 kids. Uh, over the four years we've done it, we've had the Slovakian national team playing it twice. We've had uh, over over 70 Division One commitments. Um, and they, you know, they keep coming in even as early as last week. We had a couple on August 1st that were players in the event. And it's a really uh, great mission. And I think it's something that um, has taken on a life of itself. And we're, we're pretty proud of. My wife, in fact, is the reason why it's so good because she actually runs the event. And I think if it was me or my partner running the event, we'd have some jerseys and some ice time at be event, but her attention to detail is unlike, you know, anything we could have ever done, you know, by ourselves. So I think that's a, one of the big differentiators is Kate Vesey and, um, you know, just really the information we provide, you know, we have, we start, kick it off with a 450 person welcome reception. We do, you know, past hors d'oeuvres, live music. We have presentations from myself. I give a, you know, uh, a speech on development and perspective. And then we bring up the Ivy League schools and we talk about, you know, their universities and, you know, um, the process of recruiting. Uh, the next morning, we do another round table with all the non-Ivy schools. We had 18 schools uh, working the event this past year, probably another 25, 30 recruiting the event. Um, so, you know, there's a ton of schools, uh, recruiting it because of the player pool is so good, but also because it's time during the NCAA coaches convention, which is when they're all down in Naples, Florida. So, uh, that was one of the, the, the big, you know, another big reason why we picked that timing is because it was easy for the coaches to, to be there and to see some great hockey when they're done with that convention. So. Yeah, short drive up to uh, to head up and, and watch it, which is uh, why I know, yeah, exactly. uh, you know, on the women's side, there's very similar kind of showcase, um, but the same similar timing as well, because uh, everybody's already there. So let me talk about some of the other unique differentiators. Um, so I don't know if you're responsible for the band coming in and playing, you know, um, but uh, that's awesome. I heard. Do you know, do you know where that band is? Yeah, the, no, that's them every year. Oh, it's the actual Cornell band. OK, so the, so the one in April, we do the Cornell alumni. So okay. all the Cornell band member alumni, they get together and they come and play once a year at our event. The one in June is the actual Cornell pep band. So that's awesome. Well, I, I don't know how you did that, but that that's that makes it extremely unique. Um, let's yeah. talk to more, you know, uh, you know, recruiting related stuff. So one of the things that, that that's unique about the men's side versus the women's side is that in April, the the um, upcoming recruiting class can talk to, to coaches at you know at the event so I, it was just a little weird for me who had only been to mostly women's events you know this time of year to be able to you know my son or myself to go and talk to a coach directly and not have to worry about what we were saying or how we were saying it and all that kind of stuff yeah. you could actually get into a recruiting conversation so so that was awesome um in terms of times of year um the other thing which was unique is that you had a dedicated coach to you know a team for the entire weekend so the coach is watching the player the entire weekend so they're giving consistent feedback and actually getting to know the players so obviously there's pros and cons because there aren't as many coaches you know that you're interacting with you know as you, you play each game but still it's, you're getting a pretty dedicated piece of it but the kind of the the, the piece de resistance was you know a week and a half later or so after the event ended you know i i unexpectedly received an email because i signed you know my son up through my email saying here's the feedback from the coach on your son with different ratings on five or six different attributes on my son's potential to play d1 hockey and that would just like made my brain explode because you would never see that at, in, in women's at a women's hockey event uh, and I've yeah. never never seen it at a men's hockey event either so maybe just talk about that feedback loop and, yeah. and kind of the principles behind behind having coaches kind of dedicated to you know um, whatever it is 18 players yeah. uh, for the entire weekend yeah we felt we felt like you know from a culture piece of the team to have one coach and to have them get to you know these coaches believe it or not they still want to win it doesn't matter if it's a showcase, if it, they have a random group of kids coming on a team that they're coaching, they're competing against each other in the coach's room. They're having a lot of fun with it. They really want to win and they're, they're competitive guys just by nature. So um, to have one coach get to know the players really start to build like a little mini team, similar to how we used to do it with Team New York going to the uh, Select 17 Festival or stuff like that. That was kind of the idea behind that. Um, 
what's cool is that one coach is on the bench, but all the other coaches are very visible and on the glass. I mean, that's, our coaches are phenomenal. They um, are great people and they do things the right way. And we try to always bring in the coaches who are like that. We make sure that, you know, the coaches are providing the value to the parents. And those are the kind of coaches we align with. Um, and obviously we have the Ivy League schools, but the other schools really it's about the, the individuals and how much um, attention to the game they're going to give and how much value they're going to provide. So um, the other, the other question was, uh, sorry, was the, uh, um, so I'm just wondering, you know, why, why oh, the, the feedback, feedback? Yeah. Yeah, 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 the feedback. Yeah. Yeah. So the feedback um, really was a function of my childhood getting in the car after these events with my dad and we drive away from the rink. And he, I'd say, you know, he said, how do you think you played? I said, I thought I played pretty good. And she said, me too. But we had no idea what anyone else thought, you know, and we really, that was it. You go home and that was all you got. You had no real idea of Still what like you could work today. on, Still like how, how you could, yeah, how, how you can get better. What is there? And so for me, it was a matter of like giving them something to improve, improve upon. And that was what we, um, when we talked to the coaches in our meetings before the event, we really talk about you know, how, how can we give these people constructive, uh, these players constructive feedback so that they can have a chance to develop some of the skills that they maybe aren't um, at the level in or, you know, have potential in to really play at a high level. So that was, that's where that, that comes from. And, and, you know, we, we review all those and make sure they're really good. Um, you know, we uh, definitely, it's a big part where of, of our process where we want to make sure that the kids are getting good feedback we've actually sent a few back sometimes and said hey there's a little light you know we gotta beef this up a little and g give the kids something more than uh i hope you had a great time so it was yeah. uh it's it's important to me and it's important to kate and, and my partner sean um that we do do things the right way yeah and and you know almost that alone is worth the price of admission to to, to coming to the event um just because you, you don't get it right it's just very yeah. hard and you know there are you know, you know you can submit video to you know coaches to review and things like that but it ain't the same as somebody who's watching for three or four games over a course of three or four days and, right. and and you know um and and take like you said taking the time and doing it properly and yeah. and also kind of standardizing it which you did too like there was a you know, yeah. like a paragraph portion to it and then specific attributes. How do you rate on each of these different dimensions? So I, I, I thought that was really well done. And, and I really wish, Thank you. you know, more showcases would, would do that because that really does close the loop. Like you said, uh, you know, like yeah. in the car, you know how you did, you know, it might be a week later, but it's still better than, uh, um, yeah. you know, not getting it at all. Um, and, and you also have a, a more junior version of it uh, uh, several weeks later. Maybe just talk about that one as well. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we're really trying to, again, at our mission, influence players and families use hockey as a vehicle to get it to the best school possible. And after we did the first year, we realized that some of the players are past the point of influence. You have some, you know, 18, 19 years old, and there's only so much they can do with their academic career at that point um, to really help their grades and things like that. So we said, well, how can we start to influence the kids at a younger age to really start to get in their head before high school? you know, so that they can really attack this with a different perspective uh, and a different understanding of the opportunities that are awarded to those who excel both on and off the ice. And so that's why we started the younger one. Um, the younger one is a little different. It's by, uh, it's three different age groups and there's four, four teams basically in each age group. Um, and they, and they play a competitive, they do a practice and then four, four games. So. Gotcha. Okay, perfect. All right. So I think we covered everything we want to do about the showcase. Maybe let's just talk into, you know, like parents raising their kids, you know, and, and helping them be successful in their, in, in, in their hockey careers and, and their hockey paths. You're, you're now a hockey dad. Um, maybe just talk about some of the things that you're doing that are the same as kind of like your parents did and things that you're going, well, okay, I'm doing this completely different with, 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 yeah. with your family, with your son in particular. My, my parents are pretty good. I think the benefit of my dad, you know, just with me was he, he didn't play hockey. So his focus was really just working hard, you know, and competing and, and, uh, and having fun. And that was, you know, that was good enough for him, you know? And so I try to really bring that to my son, Charlie, he's nine. And, you know, he is, um, it's so funny, like his stride and the way he kind of competes and protects the bug. He looks similar to me at like a young age. It's kind of funny how genetics work that way, but um, I just want to make sure the game's fun and we're doing things and not, 
overdoing it. I think a lot of times in this day and age, uh, you know, kids get on the ice so much and it becomes a job too early. And then by the time they're 14, 15, they don't want to do it anymore. And they have enough courage to stand up to their parents and say, I don't want to do this anymore. You know, and really for me, it's about him having the love of the game. If that's what he wants to do. If it's not, we'll spend our time, you know, doing whatever he's passionate about, but he seems to love it right now. And I'm trying to keep it fun for him and make sure that um, we don't do too much. If we do something, there's quality, you know, we, we go, go on the ice and he does things where he works hard and there's quality and that's, that's it. And then we go out and go all home and grab my tea, do something else and relax. So um, it's a long road. And that, I think that's where parents kind of um, miss, you know, misstep a little bit is they don't understand the, the journey to get there. And it's a very, very long road. And if, if you don't have that perspective, you know, it's very easy to get caught up and we need to be playing 12 tournaments in the spring and we need to be flying all over. And, you know, a lot of times the reality is if the kid, you know, stayed home and shot pucks, he'd be becoming a better hockey player than, you know, chasing everything around. And so. Perfect. So um, you're, you're now interacting with a lot of the parents who are, you know, have kids age 12 to 18 or 19. Yeah. Um, are you seeing parents with misplaced expectations? Um, you know, how, uh, you know, wh where are parents getting it wrong and where are parents getting it right as, yeah. as it relates to their expectations for their kids? You know, I, I think misplaced expectations are always going to be there with parents. You know, I think that's uh, never going away. I, it was there when we were growing up. It's it's going to be there forever. But, um, you know, I think where a lot of the parents who come to our events um, get it right is they they have a they're educated and they have a, a a vision of education for their for their kids. Right. And so that's works well with what we provide, right? And that's why we're attractive to a lot of those families because we're reinforcing those messages that they're telling their kids, you know, at home. And I think it's really good when a, a player or a young, you know, teenager can hear it from a, a different voice and have the same message and say, oh, well, I maybe my dad was right, you know, or maybe my mom was right. And um, so we always try to, you know, be that additional support and, and preach the same message. So I think that's where a lot of parents align with us. I'm curious, um, you know, there were some new NCAA rules uh, came out in the last week and a half or so in terms of the number of scholarships um, that a, a school can have. Um, they can either go, you know, all 26 players on the team are going to get scholarships or they can still keep the 18 and then have unlimited number of players on the roster. I'm wondering if you have a point of view on that and how that might impact Ivy League school since you're such an expert on the Ivy League. Yeah, I mean, the Ivies, I mean, the Ivies need scholarships. You know, we, we got to get some scholarships in the Ivy League uh, sports. I mean, these they're at such a disadvantage for recruiting, especially now with NIL money and, you know, full scholarship plus NIL money for a lot of these kids coming out. It's, you know, it's very hard for these guys to recruit and it's very hard to build a competitive team. And that's why when you see, you know, Ivy League schools, um, being successful, it's a really testament to their recruiting, to their coaching staff, to their development over, over years, um, because it's not, it's not easy. They're severely uh, handcuffed when it comes to the, the scholarship aspect of it. Um, again, you know, you're, you're looking for a specific type of kid there, you know, who's going to those schools. Um, as far as having, you know, what was it, 26 scholarships, you said, or whatever, you know, I think that's great for other schools. I think it's, uh, you know, college and the cost of schooling and sports have gotten so out of control uh, for people who've grown up to have the ability to have college paid for, for, for the whole roster, I think is something that's phenomenal and, and terrific. And um, hopefully that helps a lot of people out. Okay, perfect. All right. So now um, kind of last couple of quick questions on player development. So if, yeah. uh, you know, uh, as you think about, you know, your son and, and everything that you've done with, with Matterhorn Fit, um, what kind of path would you be recommending to parents that their if they have like 11 or 12 year old kid for them to follow if they want to kind of maximize their potential as a hockey player? Yeah, I think that's a tough question because I think it is different for everyone. There's kids who are multi-sport athletes at that age. And we see a lot of them who can't come to our event because they're playing high level lacrosse or baseball in the spring. And every time I talk to a parent about that, I'm like, I love, I actually like love that. I'm like, yeah, I get it. I love it. 
you know, do that as long as you can, and then you'll end up picking a sport. So it's very hard to kind of say because that that individual could be doing himself, uh, you know, a, a great job in development because he's being an athlete, you know, and ultimately um, protecting his body in a different way than having a repetitive motion over and over again for 12 months a year. So, you know, I think the biggest thing is passion for the game. You know, if, if you love it, you're going to work at it. And if you don't love it, you're not. And I think for parents is really letting the kids drive that uh, desire to work or desire to get better because ultimately if you don't, I, I feel like it'll, it'll be a strain on the relationship at some point and you want them, you know, to work and do stuff and they don't just don't want to do it. And then ultimately it affects, you know, your relationship. So um, at the end of the day, these are kids, you know, 99.9% of them are not going to play in the NHL. Right. Uh, very few of them are going to play division one college hockey. And so it's really a matter of um, teaching the lessons from the game to help them become successful adults. That's, that's how I feel about it, at least for my family. So. Gotcha. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things which, which I've noticed with my son is that this truly is a marathon, not a sprint because my, my son continues to go through this. He's got, you know, st definitely two, maybe three more years before he would start college. And when I think of who the best players were when he was, you know, seven and eight years old, you know, many of them stopped playing hockey or they stopped playing, you know, at least competitive hockey. And, you know, my son just keeps climbing and climbing. He, he has never been, you know, the, the, the all-star on, on his team and things like that, but he just keeps going further and further. I'm just curious, you know, you had 10 players, uh, play college hockey from you know your goals team i'm wondering you know how far you went compared to them with with your work ethic and your mindset yeah um one i would say one of the farther ones um you know i i'm trying to think of the guys who they, they a lot played division one but you know we had uh a pretty decent amount played pro believe it or not a couple a couple guys end up having really nice careers but you know it's yeah i was i did you know, in line with those guys, if not a little more, probably. And and so what was it that kind of set you apart, you know, from and and, and kept you at the, at the front of that pack when, you know, you kind of started obviously a little bit younger, but you started to kind of further behind them? Yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, the work ethic, you know, the the focus, you know, and, and the mental side of the game that would allow me to be successful. You know, I was very, op I'm optimistic. I'm a very optimistic person. I'm positive. Um, I had great self-talk and uh affirmations for myself and really just learning how to control my mind was is a big um advantage when when you get to pro sports and even the college sports because everyone's good everyone can produce there's guys who are way more talented to me than me most guys were um but i would always you know mentally find a way to be engaged and focused and be able to produce because of it so Perfect. That is the absolute perfect way to end this and talk about how, uh, you know, the things that separate you and keep you going further as, as, as a player to, to take it to the, to the peak. And obviously, you know, you, uh, you, you made it to what, what every uh, boy wants to do is eventually make it to the NHL. So uh, once again, I want to thank you for, for coming on the podcast, Ryan. Thanks for sharing so much about your, your player development, your career in, in, in pro hockey. And then obviously, obviously great learning about Matterhorn fit and obviously the Ivy league showcase. So thank you so much for doing this. Awesome. Thank you. I really want to thank Ryan for joining me on the podcast. He shared some great insights about the college recruiting process, attending college hockey showcases, and player development. You can connect with Ryan on the Matterhorn Ivy League website or his Champs app profile. Links to both are in the show notes. Introducing the Champs app messaging tool. Champs app messaging is the fastest, easy way to send error-free messages to coaches. The Champs app messaging tool ensures the coach's name, email, and school are correct without the need to look online and find each coach's contact information. With the Champs app messaging tool, you can choose from a variety of email templates to send. For example, one template informs coaches about upcoming events or tournaments, and another lets a coach know about new videos added to your Champs app profile. Each template automatically populates the message with the coach's name and school and inserts personal information from your Champs app profile. This way, you can be sure the emails do not have errors. Personalize each message further to make it uniquely yours. Experience the convenience of the Champs app messaging tool yourself by logging into your Champs app account. For a limited time, we are offering the Champs app messaging tool at a low introductory price for an annual subscription. As we add more amazing features to the messaging tool over the coming weeks and months, these new features will be included in your annual subscription. 
So get started today by logging into your Champs app account to try out the new Champs app messaging tool and easily send error-free emails to coaches. Subscribe today before the price goes up.